Welcome to the Working Preacher Books Podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. Along with Bandit the Podcast, as we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. So in this episode, we are talking with sung Young, author of Digital Homiletics, The Theology and Practice of Online Preaching, and his volume is our 15th book in the Working Preacher book series. So we're very excited about that. Welcome, sung Glad you can join us for this podcast. Thank you, Caroline Rove. Happy to be here and so honored. Well, sung before we get started talking about your book, we wanted to have you introduce yourself and so our listeners can learn a little bit more about who you are. Sure. Thank you. So I'm currently teaching at Jody Fox University as an associate professor of Christian ministries. And also I serve as a director of the Margaret Fair Scholars Program, which is a joint bachelor's and master's degree program in Christian ministries. Uh, regarding my faith background, I am ordained by the PCUSA and had a decade-long career as a local preacher before my academic tenure. And these days, thanks to my uh, denomination affiliation, I often engage in guest preaching. And indeed, my guest preaching experiences, especially during the pandemic, have greatly shaped this most recent book of mine on online preaching. And today I'm so happy to have an opportunity to talk about this book, Online Preaching. I truly appreciate this delightful invitation. So thank you. Well, thank you for writing uh, this volume on the theology and practice of online preaching. You mentioned that when COVID-19 hit, so many preachers were thrown into the deep end of online preaching without much support or background. Um, I know many preachers who think back on those months or years and shudder, and uh, it was a blur. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So is this why you wrote uh, this particular book? Yes, indeed. I mean, the, this book was uh, my critical response to the shock or shudder, and I mean, some chaos back then. Specifically, when writing the book, I had two intertwined questions in mind. I believe I, uh, I write it in my introduction clearly about it. The first one was, what theology? There was some theological problem. So what theology of online digital preaching can you propose? Well, do we have anything like that? Back then, as we all may remember, not much was available back then. Nowadays, the situation is better, but back then, not much was available on the theology of online preaching. And the second follow-up question was, what effective practices of online preaching can you develop or propose based on an informed theological and theoretical understanding of online preaching? And the thing is, once again, when the global pandemic struck between 2020 and 2022, preachers, including myself, as you will remember, faced these two fundamental questions, theology and practices, right? They faced those questions but couldn't find the right resources to address these issues. They were simply in the practical mode of including myself once again, just do it, right? Something good may come out or may not, but we have no time to speculate and wander around, so let's just do it. That was the urgency that we are experiencing now back then. And I believe that since then, the situation has improved much better, I believe, as our online preaching habits become much more mature. But uh, I still thought and still think these days we need a fine resource for digital online preaching. And that's why I, I started writing this book and um, I could borrow good wisdom from many good practicing preachers out there. So yeah, that's why how, how and why I write this book, the shock we experienced. Yeah. Yeah. So to move from just survive somehow to how do we think about this and and, and what I really appreciated about uh, so many things about this book, Sungu, but uh, uh, particularly in chapter one, where you are offering and providing a theology of preaching. 
and uh, and bringing that out of Karl Barth, where you talk about Karl Barth's threefold understanding of the Word of God, the written Word as Scripture, the revealed Word as Christ, and then the proclaimed Word as preaching. And then you had a fourth dimension in the book, which is the word, the, the this word of God digitalized, right? This threefold word then becoming digitalized. And so why why create this new dimension? I was really curious about that. And do you think that the shift to this digital mm -hmm. culture is really that big? Yeah, I think so. The shift, I mean, as you just mentioned, the shift to digital culture has immensely, probably as we all know, and preachers know, that has immensely impacted how we conduct the church in general, right? And how we practice preaching specifically. Well, let, let me use an analogy to aid our understanding slightly better. Well, as we all know, around the time of Martin Luther, right? The Luther's Reformation in Germany, as we all know, the printing press appeared which was a huge effect in my right? technological leap that forever changed how we handle and how we conduct church, church and read the scripture, and consequently it impacted how we practice preaching as well. Now, what about the emergence of the worldwide internet and smartphone during the 1990s? I think even we can divide, this is a joke, but uh, we can even divide the whole human history into peers before and after the internet and smartphones. I would call it BD and AD. Before digital <laughs> and after digital. <laughs> All these digital developments, right, have dramatically changed society in general and specifically how we do our preaching. And I believe before the pandemic, the church hesitated to fully embrace the digital revolution, similar to the church's initial hesitancy during the printing revolution in Luther's time as well. Mm. But ironically, the pandemic helped the church fully adopt the best of digital culture, diligently and as faithfully as possible. So again, my short answer to your profound question is, yes, absolutely. The shift to the digital culture is significant in our perception of scripture itself and consequently in the practice of preaching. So beyond Carbar's threefold word of God's word, now we have the word digitalized that is somehow forever changing how we conduct our preaching. You know, I think most churches um, have continued to offer, even after the pandemic, at least in North America where we live, they've continued uh, to continue to stream, either stream preaching or post it afterwards digitally. Um, what do you think about that? Is that a good thing? And uh, how do we think... What's the difference between being in person or mm -hmm. online, or is there no difference? Well, the, the first portion of your question first. Well, yes, even before the pandemic, church somehow live streamed or they practiced online preaching. But the biggest difference uh, uh, before and after the pandemic is even smaller churches or like uh, everyday preachers or unknown preachers before the pandemic only like you know the, the televangelist or the big names or big churches with nice equipments and nice resources they could do it and that was the norm back then but after the pandemic now it's like a more democratized practice of online preaching mm -hmm. everybody can do it even a preacher without any congregation, I mean, physical building, they could do it. And it is being accepted naturally. It was not naturally being accepted back then. Right. Where if you do it from your office or church office, they're like, what's this guy doing out there? No concern for human contact, no concern for physical, I mean, presence of the people. We, that's abominable to the God's word, right? That was a natural perception of God's word and preaching, online preaching back then. But these days, we feel more natural about it. And toward your second question, yes, I believe that's a good movement in a sense, because uh, once again, thanks to the digital revolution, we all, including myself, we are very much prone to, I mean, we, we, are, we feel just natural when it comes to the people's online presence. And without it, we feel almost uncomfortable because 
that somehow we are programmed in a good sense, I believe. So once again, even back then as an analog, when the printing revolution happened, right? Church agitated. What is this technology development? We don't like it. The Bible is being democratized. Everybody can read it, right? Mm. And the preachers, they have been somehow, somehow very light when it comes to the, the reverence of their Holy Scripture. Well, we felt somehow that way when we were reading online Bible, right? When you're watching the online preaching. Once again, that was a shock at the beginning of this digital revolution. But I believe, thanks to the preacher's diligence and their faithfulness, we are being becoming better and better in terms of theology and practice as well. So, to, short answer to your great question is, I believe there is something really good in online preaching, and people are seeing that goodness of online preaching as we become more faithful and effective in our online preaching. You organize your book around different styles of preaching, yes. and I'll just read some of the chapter titles. The Podium Style, the mm. Conversation Style, the Reporter Style, uh, the interview style. I'm very, very interested in the rock concert style. Yes. Uh, my question is this: like <laughs> um, What do we learn? Uh, what do we learn from exploring these different preacher styles? Yeah, I, I, I want you to introduce all those ten styles. There could be more or less, but at least the ten. And the reason was, and still is plain and simple, which is, as we all know. Every preacher has their own unique preaching voice, as you may know, and we all know that, and their own preaching habits that may best function in particular styles. So each different preacher can take each different style. So each preacher is different, and so must our preaching styles. And besides, I believe, and we all know this as well too, preachers face different cultural and congregation expectations regarding the content and delivery of their preaching. And I believe that same applies to online preaching as well. I would encourage, uh, so I encourage the preacher to make good news of good use of different styles of online preaching, depending on their own individual, uh, the individual different preaching voice and different preaching context and congregation situations as well. And besides that, I believe special occasions or different texts may prompt preachers to experiment with different pre approaches to online preaching. I mean, Can you give an example of that, of an event that might say, hey, I'll try a different style? I can think of one offhand, which is one of my friends um, during COVID, when you couldn't be in the building on Easter, went to the graveyard yeah. That's good. And uh, and filmed. I mean, he recorded ahead of time from the graveyard mm -hmm. the Easter sermon. Um, but maybe you have other examples of experimenting with different styles because it's online. Yeah, I one of the styles I really appreciated. Well, I really liked was the reporter style mm. because well, through the reporter style, the preacher. I believe that is autismus. I believe that's the example I used from the Chicago's. Uh, uh, in the church, he, he he was showing, introducing, somehow interviewing in a sense, and uh, the the reporting what is happening out there inside of the church and outside of the church. Something you mentioned, I mean, some that's what can happen in the graveyard. But he was somehow scanning, showing what's happening in the inner city, right in the middle of his preaching, where the worship service itself. I mean, something, I mean, these days, as you may know, great things and some terrible things are happening out there. I don't want to name those events, but uh, when you want to really show what's happening out there in, ten, in, in terms of scriptural interpretation and in terms of scriptural response or church response, it is always, as you will know, better to show it rather than just to read it or speak mm -hmm. it. A, word, a picture has worth of like 10,000 words. And something like that can happen, thankfully, on the digital uh, space more easily and efficiently. So that's why I believe online preaching has great potential to appeal to so many folks out there through visual, sound, and words, and other bodily performance as well. Sungu, I really appreciated 
you back uh, earlier in our conversation that analogy with with the Reformation and Martin Luther democratizing the word mm-hmm. and the experience of the word. And I think the way in which you talked about that, how the digitalization of the word is is like that. More and more people are able then to access uh, preaching and to hear preaching. And it also makes me think about in some of the styles that you talked about, the reporter style and the drama style and the artist style, I think one of the challenging things that I hear about online preaching is is how then do we talk about embodiment or how mm-hmm. do we talk about incarnation uh, when when there's when bodies are not in, not in the same space could you talk a little bit about how how you thought about that in this book and how you how you would uh, how you would share with our listeners the mm-hmm. the, the way i mean you were really getting that toward the end too it's a it's embodiment but it's kind of in a different way so maybe say mm-hmm. a little bit more about that yeah thanks for the question uh, that's something yeah, i discuss i guess in this book extensively well, let me begin with this. I, I, I believe we all agree that any and all forms of preaching, whether it's online or in person, they are all embodied proclamations, mm. in a sense, I believe, whether online or in person. And uh, I believe there, there are no exceptions because we use uh, the body for Christian preaching, at least, at least our vocal faculties. That's a part of our human body, right? And I believe the same applies to online preaching. Even though online preaching is transmitted and viewed through the digital screens, I believe it still relies on the human body, at least the vocal faculties, to make Christian preaching possible. On top of that, I believe digital space is highly multisensory. Highly mm-hmm. multi-sensory and aesthetic. That's a, I mean, that's basic nature of this the space. Highly multi-sensory and aesthetic. At least it utilizes this the space visuals, sound, and touch when we touch this the space, and even we can incorporate taste and smell into our experiences if we want in a five-dimensional digitally augmented reality. That is something we. I'm not really exploring in the church's life these days, but it could come <laughs> to the church's life. The five-dimensional digital augmented reality that somehow enables us to uh, to utilize the faculties of human faculties of taste and smell as well in our worship and preaching. Of course, when we celebrate the Eucharist or the the Lord's table, we we use those faculties, taste and smell. But even somehow in the future, in the near future, we can incorporate those two senses into our preaching experiences as well. So in that sense, the concept of embodied proclamation, I believe, is possible and so important for online preaching. Mm. Well, especially, I want to point out this, and as I argue in my book, that uh, online preaching should recognize the congregation, not merely as sermon listeners. Well, that is a very general and typical language we use, sermon listeners. But I want to to see what well, I want preacher when it comes to online preaching, see the congregation as sermon viewers. That's the language I use in my book as well. Or intentional sermon viewers. This means that not only what people hear, but also what they see and mm-hmm. experience on the digital screen is very important. Now we are adding right visualization beyond what we hear or what we sense through the uh, the hearing faculty. So what we see and experience on the digital screen is very important or as what equal important. In other words, how the proclamation is embodied in a sense, right? Physically or in a multi-sensory sense on digital space has become so important when it comes to online preaching. So I believe Counterintuitive, though it may sound, embodied artistic proclamation, like in the artistic style where, where rock and roll, where rock music style, where <laughs> e- even the, the drama style, I, I, as I introduced in my book, they all become very much natural and inevitable in the practice of online preaching. And I think that was one of the crucial misunderstandings and mistakes we all made, including myself, at the beginning of the pandemic. We simply thought, including myself, that we could do great online preaching simply by looking at a fixed camera, right? 
mm. and speaking really well. Just yeah. as you, <laughs> we have done in the past, right? Just to get the camera and speak very well. No more body movement or artistic dimensions and aspects incorporated into the preaching. That was a somewhat profound misunderstanding because we didn't really understand the digital space itself back then at the very beginning. But uh, we will now at this point, we all know online preaching is far more than that. It involves what it should, what it could involve the whole body and the online preaching should be an artistic enterprise. You brought up a very controversial issue, though, okay. uh, just now that I, I just... Uh, we could get in trouble for it, so I didn't tell you I was going to ask about this, but you mentioned the Lord's Supper, or, or mm -hmm. as some folks call it, you know, the Mass or the mm -hmm. Eucharist. Yeah. There was, there was controversy about sure. whether churches should encourage people at home to have bread and wine mm -hmm. present. And um, my congregation, uh, we celebrate communion every week, and the preacher says... Um, the words of institution, and then invites people forward, and then speaks to the online audience and says, for those of you watching online, please know that this, the, uh, the bread and wine are also for you. Mm -hmm. And some people at home then take bread and wine. Yeah. We're not necessarily, what do you think? <laughs> All right. As you said, there is a controversy, right? Some people may agree, some people may not agree um, based on the theology of church tradition. But uh, what can I say? I just can't tell from my own experience, <laughs> I guess. So the church I go to, PCUSA Church, um, yeah, they they just did what you, uh, you described uh, that we had in the sanctuary. I believe still we do that. That's the most important thing. Even after the pandemic, we still do that. Uh, first Sunday of each month, we still have bread and wine in the main sanctuary, but at the same time, the preacher encourages uh, the congregants at home for various reasons, for sickness or, or personal treat, or for many other good reasons, to prepare their own bread and wine. And mm -hmm. we celebrate, we recognize as the same Eucharist, what the Lord's table happening in here in the sanctuary and out there. Of course, they appear on the digital screen. And I believe that's totally fine. Well, once one time I was lecturing at my universe and I made a joke these days that was the church should be 100% physical and 100% online. Just Jesus was 100% God and 100% <laughs> human being. <laughs> People laughed about it. But I would like, that's a fantastic analogy, right? God up there, but still can be a physical, <laughs> but so maybe God on the digital screen, but at the same time, the same time. I know this is a humorous, some, somehow sound like sacrilege, but uh, well, there's some good thing happening in the online bridge. That's all I can say at this point, Ralph. Thank you. That's great. Well, maybe one last question about the book, uh, Sangu, and then we like to go to a couple questions about where you find inspiration and how that might help mm. our listeners. And so the last question uh, we I have about the book, well, actually, it's not the last question, but mm -hmm. I'll let it be the last question, is you talk about in the epilogue how, uh, yes, COVID is over, but just because COVID is over does not mean that the need for yeah. online preaching mm -hmm. and the word digitalized will go away. So what what are some of the circumstances where digital homiletics do you think remain important? Uh, and and what would be your case for yeah, COVID's over, but yeah, yep. but digital preaching is going is here to stay and this is why. Yeah, I mean let me I can give you a quick example. Well that just happened I don't know last year or a couple of years anyway. So the pandemic was almost done, and we we're like, well, let's go back to the church, right? <laughs> we can have a good time finally once again in person in the main sanctuary. I mean, particularly here in, in the state of Oregon, by the way. It was around November or December, I believe, that we were expecting some heavy storm. We were like, oh my goodness. I mean, I mean the churches were announcing there's a possibility we shut down again. And here in the 
Oregon, there's, because snow is very rare. It's not like Minnesota out there. But <laughs> when it snows, everything just stops. <laughs> we are like schools, and shops, and churches. So we are like, all right, now we have good tool of all night preaching and worship, right? We experience it. Now we're fully equipped. So for the couple of weeks, the churches were shut down. <laughs> but still worship gone, went on, and our church in, had a great time. Anyway, that, that's a, one quick sample of how online preaching could still apply after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I believe these days, many churches, as you all know, these days, most churches, whether small or be including uh, my, uh, the PCH church, they all live stream mm -hmm. their online worship yeah. and preaching. Yeah. I mean, small or big, they have to yeah. do it because people expect it. Yeah. Whether yeah. It's mm -hmm. really necessary or not. And let me tell you, in the main sanctuary right now, since pandemic is gone, now, I mean, like, probably 70 to 80 percent of the congregation they came back to sanctuary that was the party back then right during the pandemic only 10 to 20 percent showed in the main sanctuary even though the situation has become drastically changed dramatically changed we still live stream it because mm -hmm. that's people what really appreciate need for their own spiritual enhancement whether they are in the sanctuary or during the week when they can watch the worship services. So that's the situational uh, uh, context we have right now. We need to issue, uh, address and to which we have to provide good pastoral mm -hmm. care. I believe that has, has become real reality for the many preachers yeah. these days. Yeah. That's great. We have two questions for you about sources of inspiration. Uh, okay. In preaching, and one is, um, how do you get unstuck? If you get writer's block or you get stuck, mm -hmm. um, how do you get unstuck when you're writing a sermon? There are many ways we can address the issue. As a very faithful Korean charismatic Presbyterian, I should say, I pray, pray. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I pray. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But besides that, I watch movies and go to art museums mm -hmm. and uh, I walk around. But especially these days, uh, I watch good historical documentary style dramas on Netflix. So mm -hmm. recently, I've watched the rise and fall of Asian empires, the Roman Empire and Ottoman Empire and Japanese and Chinese empires. They're, they're historically dramatized uh, uh, um, uh, series and episodes, but uh, they really help me in many good ways because, as we all know, Scripture, or the Christian Bible, is in a sense a historical document. So when I watch those historical dramas and episodes and romances and you know <laughs> you know some wars yeah. and conflicts i could easily somehow uh, uh, associate myself with what's happening in the scripture so that's a one good digital inspiration source i'm finding these days that's great i love that and my question for you is are there any books that you're reading right now or any any books that you would recommend to our listeners that are feeding you either spiritually or feeding your nurturing the craft of preaching? Anything that comes to mind? Thank you for that question. Well, as you may know, my last book, Before Digital Homiletics, was Arts and Preaching. Mm -hmm. So uh, why writing the book? Uh, well, let me tell you, I'm not an artist at all, but I wrote the book. <laughs> so <laughs> I purchased books about artists and artistic movements, like mm. uh, the, uh, the, the books on Cubism, Futurism, and Dadaism, and, uh, and the Impressionism, and, the, so, and books about uh, Picasso and other great uh, art artists from the Latin America as well. So... Yeah, those are the just great food for thought these days, just reading mm -hmm. those uh, books on various artistic movements. And as you may know, many artistic books or art books, they deal with Christian arts based mm -hmm. on human, uh, the, the, the Christian scripture as well, or the Bible. So sometimes I can make easy connection between the, the secular artist reading of uh, the biblical text or arts and how they appear has appeared in human history. So, yeah, some books on arts and artists, they have become a great stable these days for me, personally. All right. We have a few that. questions from Bandit the Podcat that just, uh, he, he just requests very short answers, one or two words. 
Okay. Bandit would like to know which biblical character was most likely to own a cat. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had one, but I don't have it. But uh, Herod the Great, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Executing, I love it. Executing well, the judge. And Bandit the Podcat also wants to know mm -hmm. uh, what your favorite animal is and why it is a cat. Cat. Of course, it's Ned. <laughs> no, what he wants to know. I mean, besides himself, uh -huh. what is your favorite animal? Uh, yeah, I love dog and cat. I believe. Yeah. And recently, I don't know why, but it appears on my Instagram. I don't know why, but uh, lizard eating small worms, but oh. cute lizards. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it, but. Uh, they look so cute, these are even on the Instagram. So. <laughs> is there one, he wants to know, is there one game that you could just play endlessly without getting bored? I like the question. I like the question. Uh, do you, have you heard about Squid Game, by the way? Squid Game on Netflix. So when I was growing up, literally, I played the famous game, Squid Game. So okay. you literally do squid shape on the ground and physically play around this. So, <laughs> fun. <laughs> One more question from Bandit. He's got those. Uh, he wants to know, what food could you eat every single day, Sango? Yeah, that's what I've told my wife. Any food, or all food with tofu, I can go with it forever. Yep. Wow. All right. Tofu. Nice. All, I, I consume almost every single day. Tofu. <laughs> well, Sango, thank you for being with us, and thanks for our listeners for listening to the Working Preacher Books podcast. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thank you all for listening.